You're going to have to be able to explain what the structure of an atom is by drawing it and including the three particles, electron, proton, and neutron, and the general region called the nucleus. You're going to have to be able to construct an atom showing me the orbital structure from the atomic table of elements to produce a Bohr-Rutherford diagram. And you're going to be able to begin to predict the patterns of similarly constructed elements and their behavior they will show because of their atomic structure. This portion of the lesson is strictly background information of which you only need to know what an electron, proton, and neutron are and how they are laid out inside the atom. The theory of the atom is very ancient. It seems to originate somewhere around the time of Democritus and Aristotle, though you can throw in another dozen names you've never heard of. This is a vast oversimplification of their two very grand theories that are dimly science by today's standard. Why they wouldn't be considered true science is these were purely in their head. There was no underlying observation. Aristotle felt that nature abhors a vacuum. And if we could have taken him up to orbit, we would have been able to demonstrate to him that the vacuum is the preferred state of the universe. Aristotle thought nature abhors a vacuum and that matter could be divided infinitely into smaller and smaller particles and completely filled space. Democritus had some ideas to the opposite of that. He felt that you could chop matter into tiny pieces, but will eventually reach a tiny indestructible marble called an atom. Between the atoms is empty space, void, or vacuum. Now, there were some observations here. Democritus was able to give a scale of the atom very vaguely by discovering, you know, things like coins and building steps eroded and particles so fine you never saw them. But sure enough, a gold coin got thinner and thinner and thinner over time. So these particles were small. He felt they were always moving because even on the quietest, windless day, you could see dust moving in the sunbeams. So he was an earlier discoverer of what is called Brownian motion, which is particles larger than atoms vibrating. But he was on the right track. And there was yet another person that had the idea that if you watch a tree rot, and eventually there is no wood left, there's just dirt, and a new tree grows there, he felt that there had to be some essence, not of tree material, but some basic building block that did not decay and was reassembled. So some of these guys' thinking was just lined up beautifully with what we know, but they had limited ability to observe or dismissed observation altogether. So they are early scientists, but they were practicing more philosophy, more logic than they were direct science, according to our modern ways of thinking. The term atom comes from a uh, Greek word, tomos, meaning to cut. And a, an, ant, or ante in front of the word in English means not. So atom means not cuttable. You have a hero and an anti-hero in a story. An acid and antacid. When we get to ecology, biotic is living, abiotic is not. Graphia means you write. Agraphia is a person who cannot write. Amnesia, memory comes from the word memnon, in words like mnemonic, and amnesia means you have no memory. And amnesty, meaning the law will forget about you. You did something bad and we'll forget about it. So not remembering. Atom means not cuttable. Evidence of structure inside the atom started to come forward. They were able to determine there were two kinds of charges, a positive and a negative inside the atom. So it was no longer featureless. It was still semi-indestructible as far as they were concerned. They just knew there were charges that could be popped off them. And we've already learned those charges as positive and negative, And those were known about for more than a century earlier in terms of giving them those names and properties. But 
they were not identified with a specific particle. You may already know that these particles are called protons and electrons. So you can't have that sense of mystery that these people did when they were trying to figure it out without knowing what the answer was. And the brilliance of these people who did this um, doesn't seem so brilliant when you already know the answer. Two theories formed for the possible structure of the atom. J.J. Thompson was one of the first to propose a modern theory of the atom based on the positive and negative charges that had been discovered. And he called the atom a corpuscle. This term corpuscle means body. You have a corpse. And it's buried into a lot of other words in English. When I was a kid, red blood cells were called red corpuscles and cell phones were still called science fiction. Now we just call them red blood cells. What I find interesting in Thomson's work is this statement. I think that a theory which enables us to picture a kind of model atom and to interpret chemical and physics results in terms of such a model may be useful even though the models are crude. I would go further to say even though the models are complete fantasy. We can create models that can be interpreted, as he said, and they can be crude. They can be totally wrong. Most models are wrong. They have certain predictive and interpretive value. They did know that normal atoms were neutral and they had an equal balance of positive and negative. However, they can get a charge imbalance, something we studied in electricity, and forces will appear to try to restore neutrality. You saw the Van de Graaff and all the forces that appeared, the separating of charges. But they didn't know what the charges were until the actual particles were hunted down. The first particle discovered was Thomson himself. He succeeded in removing the negative charge from an atom in 1896 and successfully measured its charge, which is really, really, really small and is one of the fundamental constants or numbers in nature. He won the Nobel Prize for this and his discovery led directly to the television set. Another man, Millikan, actually managed to measure the mass of the electron in 1923, and the mass of an electron makes the mass of the coronavirus look like a battleship, heck, a fleet of battleships by comparison. So to be able to do this at the time period, when half the science equipment was still made out of wood, was bloody impressive. Here's a beam of electrons moving through a tube, and a magnet will deflect them, and was the basis for a television set. At some point, someone sat down and went, geez, if a magnet bends a beam of electrons, if I did this really, really fast with two electrons, I wonder if I could paint a movie. Notice over here, there's no connection. You actually have a little Tesla coil jumping the air gap. So if you take university physics, you'll get to do this. This picture is of a nuclear reactor that's underwater. Water shielding is a great way to protect us. And high speed electrons that come flying out of destroyed atoms create this blue glow called Cherenkov radiation. And it's a classic sign of high energy electrons coming to a drastic halt when they hit water. How these pieces fit together. At this point we knew about the electron. We could knock it out of the atom leaving behind this positive mystery. They suspect there's another charge involved. They know it's positive. They just don't know what form it takes. Is it a particle? Is it um, just an energy field? So Thomson proposed what he called the plum pudding model which was a vast positive field of charge that was studded with the electrons like chips in a chocolate chip cookie. 
pull the electrons out is like pulling the chocolate chips out of the cookie. And this model was considered a very good model, but some people, like Hantero and Agoka in Japan, were concerned because they were under the impression these charges could not be shoved into each other. They seemed to bounce off each other, so he didn't see how the electrons could live inside the nucleus, and he had his model, called the Saturnian model, where he proposed the electrons were like the rings of Saturn, a big storm of electrons circling the nucleus. And Rutherford was attracted to this model. He thought, you know, it's... That sounds uh, quite reasonable. So he set in motion a series of experiments to try to see if perhaps the electrons were orbiting in a way at a distance. This became known as the planetary model, a central nucleus of positive charge surrounded by orbiting negatives. And so we had these two competing models that look like this. Rutherford very comfortably looking like the Earth orbiting the Sun. We have analogies elsewhere. And Thompson, with this also very good model that, hey, you got this big positive charge and the reason why atoms are neutral is this big fat positive is completely shorted out when the electrons join it. So the two models seem quite good. So how do you hair split them? Well, I'm going to create an example that was not used in reality. So I'm going to make claims for these models that were never advanced to my knowledge. I doubt Rutherford worried about the macroscopic predictions, the predictions of his model on the large scale. These kind of men were very target fixated. I'm sure they knew that following their model's prediction beyond the situation they proposed it for was a fool's game. I'm sure they entertained these possibilities late at night or while sipping a good scotch but they riveted themselves at work to its narrowest purpose. Does my model help me understand the observations, interpret data, and make predictions on what I am working on right now? A model is not reality, nor is it a miniature copy of it. Science fiction leads you to believe that all models are scale models. This is not true. So let's look at some attributes of this model that I'm creating, for example. All of you know the electron orbits the atom. If you had any science at all, you know that's to be the truth. And kids usually snicker when I say Thompson's plum pudding model. But let's take a look at a prediction of these two models that makes Thompson seem really reasonable. Thompson's model could explain why atoms take up space. Positives hate positive. If there's this giant field of positive energy, no two atoms would get near each other. They'd hold distance and they would pack like marbles in a, in a pail. But the Rutherford model, the electrons are like piles of hoops. Um, how, they're like rings. Everything should collapse. Uh, we shouldn't have much volume at all. So Rutherford is like, gotta remember, when a planet's in orbit, there is no ring. This little black ring of its path isn't there, right? So try to imagine dumping solar systems in a box. There's mostly emptiness. Why is there any space between atoms at all? So Rutherford's model makes us all seem like mist. There's nothing there. So Thompson looks pretty reasonable. But I'm sure these men never thought of that because they were working on what does this atom look like, not what does a human being look like assembled from these atoms. Here's another way of looking at it. The Thompson model would pack and occupy space. The Rutherford model, what the heck is in between those spaces? So I took the orbits away. We just got these electrons flying around in here. Why on earth does this not collapse? Again, this is my use of the model to show you how one model can fail to make predictions. It works in one area, but it suddenly has a prediction that's quite strange. So we're going to see how they were able to decide which of these two models was the one that actually corresponded to reality. The second particle discovered was the proton, and that was done by Rutherford. And Rutherford spent some of his time in Canada. 
he blasted gold foil with radiation and discovered a hard central nucleus of positive charge that bounced back the rays. But most of it just went right through the gold. This meant what we saw as solid matter is actually mostly empty space. It shocked the world. When you pound your fist on the hardest steel, it is no more solid than a patch of fog. We should be able to walk through each other. The empty space in you is 2,000 times bigger than the actual solid matter. So this means the atoms of the entire high school could hide inside the empty spaces in you if for some reason the atoms would be willing to get closer together. And this is the puzzling part. Atoms are not like this at all. They're like this. So the next question, of course, is why are they avoiding each other? Why are they staying apart, forming a solid material, but another solid material can't slip through the gaps? And that, of course, would be the next question. The third particle discovered, James Chadwick isolated the neutron in 1932, which was a nuclear particle of no charge whatsoever. Monsieur and Madame Joliet Curie laid the groundwork for the discovery uh, and they paid the price with their lives from playing with radiation. The neutron has no bearing in chemistry, but it's an important particle to learn for some other reasons I'll show you later. One of the things you can do with neutrons, since they're highly penetrating and not charged, they're very hard to deflect from their path and they can be used to produce great detail similar to x-rays, but the nifty thing about neutrons, they're not really fond of going through water. So if you took an x-ray of the flower at right, you'd see nothing. But the neutron photograph gives you detail. You can tell this isn't an x-ray of the person at the left because you can actually start to see bits of their brain. So neutron photography is very um, highly used, but it's quite expensive to do. And it's behind a lot of our modern equipment control that you may not be aware of. So you can neutron photograph uh, an engine block that would completely block x-rays and you can look for microscopic fractures. Without this technique, our jet aircraft would not be nearly as good as they are. All those delicate moving parts in a jet engine are photographed using this technique to look for microscopic cracks that could not be detected any other means. And without it, uh, I really wouldn't trust the number of jet engines we're able to assemble and make sure they're not ready to blow up in use. Your balls. <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to show off here. I've done this before. I just want to show you the uh, effort it took me to edit these videos together. You see this over here? Capture 23. That's right, in order to record this 15 minute segment, I did 23 tries of different parts of it. Despite that, if you look here between the four minute and the eight minute mark, do you see how many cuts are in there? That's how many things I chopped out, actually twice that many. Every black gap is a section I trimmed out. You see it right here? Sometimes it was just as much as me going, uh, um, uh, or one of the kids yelling daddy in the background before I like hit him and made them. No, I didn't say that part. But I want you to see that, you know, when I'm asking you to re-edit your work and try, try again, um, I hold myself to the same standards, in fact, a lot worse. So this 15 minutes has taken me about three hours to record. Now, why would I do that? Does it indicate I have no social life? Absolutely. I'm in my 50s. I have no social life. Um, but there are 90 of you, and I use this stuff over and over again. Um, it's worth it. It's my time, but then when I multiply it by all 90 of you, if I can trim five minutes out of these videos or get rid of a lot of stammering, I don't want to be embarrassed when I put this stuff on YouTube. Uh, so this is why, and you can hear all the uhs and so's that we say in daily speech, and in many cases that's all I've done here, is I'll take out like uh, that and I'll remove it. And you might even hear where I got sloppy today, where I edited it. 